The Road to Recovery podcast and SNJ Today presentation. Watch each week's TV program at snjtoday.com. After nearly eight years of drug addiction, Michael de Leon spent 12 years in prison in halfway houses for a gang related homicide. Since his time in prison, he's dedicated his life to making the world a better place. He is the founder of Steered Straight, which guides young people away from the dangers of drugs and criminal activity. As a motivational speaker, he has spent thousands of hours talking to millions of young adults, and he has worked tirelessly to help people suffering find the road to recovery. Welcome to The Road to Recovery. I'm Michael DeLeon, your host, and every week I get the honor to uh, sit down with someone talking about recovery, recovery from addiction, talking sometimes about the tragedy uh, of losing lives and the, um, the heartache that families are going through, talk to clinical people and treatment centers. This is a problem that affects us all, and it's something that we have to talk about and we have to address, but when someone has turned their whole life around. I'd love to show their story of recovery, and today is no exception. I have with me a good friend, Katie Sloman. Katie, thanks so much for joining us today. Yep. Talking about your recovery story and how amazing it is. I've been uh, a small part of it, and I've just been so grateful to uh, see your growth and amazing uh, turnaround of your life, you know? And, uh, you know, you're inspiring. And um, where did it all begin for you? Where did kind of things start for you? Um, well, when I was about, I, grad I graduated high school, um, kind of met a group of friends who smoked weed, drank, um, kind of did everything that I was raised not to do. Um, and I started, you know, slowly kind of doing what they were doing. Um, started more with the drinking um, on occasion, then smoking, and you know, it was, what's the word? I, my mind drove blank, but um, I, mean, I really, you know, when I, when I think about why, like, I, I started doing it, you know, I think there was always a curiosity um, about, like, the effects and how it feels. Because in my house, like, we don't have alcohol. We, you know, you didn't smoke. And, um, I also wanted to fit in with them, like that's all they did. And so it started with that and um, it kind of became an everyday thing and it affected my school. Um, I could have done better in college my first two years. And you know, I kind of slacked because my life was centered around going to hang out, meeting guys, smoking, drinking. Um, and it, you know, it didn't really escalate and I went to Virginia Beach for school and I thought it was a new start. Um, and it just, you know, I was still searching for those friends that were doing the same thing that I was doing at home. Um, I wasn't smoking, but I was still drinking on occasion. Um, my grades still showed for it. I still had the behavior of, you know, these behaviors that were just negative. And, right. Um, I ended up coming back home. I got kicked out of the school, unfortunately. And, came back home, uh, started working, and this is when I met this guy who told me he was an addict, um, said he was trying, you know, he was trying to get help, and he was going to IUP, and me not understanding this idea of addiction and how strong it is and how easy it is to get kind of caught up in it. Right. Um, it was just kind of like, okay, you're getting help. I thought, you know, he'd get help and he'd stop, he'd be good. Um, and like maybe a week later, he offered me um, an opiate. A pill, a, pill, a prescription yeah. opiate pill. And without hesitation, um, I took it. And that's something I actually look back on occasion. I'm like, man, like no flags popped up. Like nothing, I, you know, there was no looking at the consequences. It was just, okay, I'll do it. Did you not look at opioid pills as something that you could become addicted to? Like you had no, really concept how dangerous it was? No, I had no idea what, really what they were. I knew they were painkillers, um, but I didn't know the, much about the addictive quality. Um, and, you know, it started off slow. Like, I would use every now and then, and then I started working as a delivery driver, so I had cash every single day, 
and so, like real quick, it was I was using every single day. Wow. And I didn't see that I that it was a problem. Um, I didn't experience the neg negative effects yet. Um, I thought I was managing. I was like, I have money in the bank. I I can just live my habit with the cash I make. Like everything's good. I have a place to live. Like you know, and all these behaviors were were showing up. Like I was lying to my parents. Like I purposely got into a fight with my parents so I could get so I could leave my house and go live with this guy. Um, and it's insane. Like, family has always been first in my life. Right. And, like, that quick turnaround that I didn't even see as an issue. Like, I didn't see that, you know, addiction was really there. Um, and eventually, like, it just, it went downhill. Like, soon enough, I was losing hours at work. I was acting out at work, kind of, like, unwilling to do anything. I just wanted the money. And um, like the second I got my money, I wanted to leave. I was always late on deliveries. Like, why did it take so long? You know, coming up with excuses. And eventually, like, I just quit. Um, so I had no income. And my the guy I was seeing at the time, like, he had lost his job, and he was jobless. So, you know, it went downhill really fast. And like, soon enough, I was in my car. Um, you know, I didn't want to go home. I didn't want to face my parents. Like, I don't think they had, I don't know if they had any idea what was going on. Right. Um, if they did, they didn't tell me. Um, but I chose, like, to sleep in my car just so I could keep getting my next one. And, you know, that relationship was just a toxic relationship. We were just together for the drugs. And, um, you know, I didn't even focus on trying to find a job because it was a full-time job trying to... Your addiction became your full-time job. Wow, this is a spiraling out of control story of addiction, and we'll hear how Katie turned it all around right after this. Welcome back to The Road to Recovery. I'm Michael DeLeon with Katie Sloman, and um, this spiraled out of control addiction, you know, happened pretty quickly. Um, but all throughout your, you know, your uh, young years and young adult years, smoking marijuana and drinking, really no consequences. Um, obviously it affected your life, but no real consequences. So nothing stopped him getting kicked out of college, right? No consequences, but you still didn't look at it as uh, the drugs mm -hmm. being the cause of it. And then you just said yes to an opioid pill and that took you to homeless in your car. So where did you go from here? Eventually I tried going home. Um, I got to the point where I was sick and tired of leaving my car and like um, at this point like my parents knew something was up because they tried an intervention um, with people from my church and I just denied that there was anything wrong and like one night it was like I remember it was like 10 o'clock at night and I just called my dad like crying like can I just please come home and they let me back and like I thought like maybe if I'm home like it'll be easier to stop. And um it wasn't the case, like I couldn't stay stopped. Um my condition for staying there was that I had to um attend like not, like a treatment. Um I was insistent on not doing inpatient because I didn't think I needed it. I said I wasn't like, you know, everyone else, I wasn't doing heroin. Right. I, I wasn't using as much as everyone else. Like I had all these excuses, but I agreed to go to IOP three times a week. And you know, I managed to not use for a few days. But then I had, this was at the process where I was joining the army. You joined the army, mm -hmm. figuring that would help. So I had, my ears were stretched and I had them sewed up and they prescribed me um, painkillers. So in my mind, it's a perfect excuse to keep using because um, I can get away with it because it's prescribed. Prescribed by a doctor. And my counselor, I, brought, I remember bringing it to IOP. I was like all like, kind of like high, pulling one over on you. And he took me, threw him out. Um, called me out in front of everyone in our IOP and I didn't like that at all. Um, he, he told me joining the army wasn't gonna keep me clean. Said it was a bad idea. Told me I was gonna eventually do heroin and I was like, Dad said, I'll, I'm never going to do that because right. I know better. And um, I walked out a week later. I was doing heroin, um, living with my 
my ex because he was supplying everything I needed and um, working as a waitress, still trying to you know, go through the process of joining the Army. And um, I even tried planning it out like when I need to stop using. Right. And I went to my physical and um, I wasn't clean. Um, and I don't know, you know, how I passed the test or if they even tested for opiates, I'm not sure. But I guess I signed my contract and then I'm like, oh, well, I'm leaving in December. I have, this was in October, so I was like, I have about two months before I need to stop. I need to stop at least two weeks before I leave. Just you're going to stop, yeah, all these plans. Never did. Um, December 29th, I shipped out. Um, I used the day before. I drank in the morning at the, at the airport when I was leaving South Carolina. And then went to South Carolina, and I was miserable. Um, the withdrawal set in. Um, couldn't sleep, but I wasn't getting sleep anyway because we were in the you, process of right. basic training. And um, it got to the point where but, like, the anxiety of my depression was so bad. Um, to, so I ended up seeing their, their psychologist there, and he told me I, he was being medically separated. Now, whether they had any idea that this was withdrawal or anything, I don't know. Um, What's your dream, really? This military dream that was gone, and you're losing this real opportunity, and you come home, and you're using right away again. Went back to working at the diner, thinking everything was going to be great. And it was like, subconsciously, just went, did what I was used to doing, and you know, still didn't think there would be consequences. Um, thought I could still get away with it. And, um, you know, my parents were like, well, we'll give you your car back if you can pass a drug test. So I tried playing, okay, well, they're going to give it to me this day, so I just need to stop using here. And that didn't work. Um, got kicked out again, moved back with my ex, who's still supporting my habit. Um, and in March, like, I had this, I had that moment of just desperation. I was just, I was done. And, like, I didn't want to live like that. I was, it was like, I was just sick and tired of just feeling like the way right. I was. And I called my dad and I went to treatment. Um, and like I was relieved. I remember sitting in detox and everyone's miserable because they're just, you know, they're coming off of whatever they're coming off of. And I'm like working on step work, you know, journaling, sure. um, participating in group. Like I was just, ex I was just happy. We'll talk with Katie right after this. Back on the road to recovery, and uh, you know this is where the story takes that good turn. I mean, you you get to treatment, you're um, relieved, and you're excited. And did you? Just, what was, it was like you gave yourself permission finally to get clean, and you took everything seriously. I mean, treatment yeah. really worked. It did, and I, like this was my first time in treatment, and like I remember getting to after detox, I went up to North Jersey um, for the inpatient for 30 days. And um, I was, that's when the anxiety kicked in. And I remember my first day sitting in the quarter, not knowing anyone, kind of not sure what to expect, but there was still that relief there. Like, uh -huh. you know, I wasn't looking for my next one. And, you know, there's still that nervousness of, well, what's gonna happen when I leave? Um, when I finally left, like, I really wanted to stay clean. Um, they had given me suggestions on what to do. And like, they suggested 12 step meetings and you know, getting, you know, changing people, places, and things, and so I did, like, I, I followed it, but there was still, you know, 30 days, 90 days, well, my, my 90 days clean, like, I relapsed, and I overdosed on that relapse, and um, I remember waking up in an ambulance, like, thinking it was a dream, and then when I realized it wasn't, like, I started freaking out, because I'm like, well, why did I pick up again? Like, I didn't want this, and, like, I was so panicked, and I was like, well, you know what? This is this this will scare me into just never picking up again. And two days later, I was right back at it. Really? And um, it was it's a scary thing. Like I don't I don't like looking back at it because you know I don't know how I made it through through that. And like I still you know I can't can't believe like that I picked up, but it's like I wasn't really doing what I was supposed you know what helped what was helping me. Right. And um, so I went back. I, went on a, a short little run for like a few weeks and then went back to detox. 
and, and I was like, I need to do something different. And I went to a different IOP. You know, I tried out sober living, and um, even though I didn't want to, um, but I gave it a shot and it worked. And I was working for a while and like I was working, I was going to 12 step meetings. I was, you know, my network was a better network. Right. And, um, you know, I just wanted to be present. And like, I eventually like, I got my car back, I had a job. And like, it felt good to be like on my own. Like I love that independence. And, um, you know, then I got into a relationship and that was not a good relationship. Um, I ended up getting pregnant and I ended up breaking up with him. I started working back at the pizza place I was working at, delivering pizzas, even though from everyone in my network told me that was a bad idea. Right. And, you know, I thought I knew better. And um, by November of 2015, yeah, 2015, like, well, December, more so, like, I picked up. Um, still, you know, I still felt, I felt guilty. You know, I remember I taking my first one and it was, and I knew it was because, like, I still wasn't practicing any positive principles in my life. Like, I wasn't being honest. I wasn't willing. Right. Um, and, um, you know, I remember the day that it happened, this kid, I had, I was about to clock out and this, this kid I was working with was like, oh, you're just going to spend that on drugs because everyone knew that I was in recovery. That's how I got my job back. Like, you know, I, I told them I was honest and um, I don't know what it was, but that just, it just kind of flipped a switch and I just went and um, parents obviously soon found out, not long after, not very good at keeping it hidden. And um, I was back out, you know, in my car. Pregnant. Pregnant, you know, working, trying to make enough money to have, have a hotel room each night, as well as keep, you know, from being sick. And um, January 8th, I went to Florida. Yeah, it was the 8th. I went to, or yeah, it was the 8th. Inpatient treatment. I went to Florida for treatment. And um, something was different this time. Like, I don't, you know, I, I don't even know what was different. I think there was just that ultimate surrender. You know, I didn't fully surrender the first time. Um, I think, you know, when I first went to treatment, like, even though I wanted to stay clean, there was still something in the back of my head that was like, oh, you could, you could do this. You can still use one more time. Right. Um, and so this time, like, I remember sitting in treatment and I, I was, I just wanted to go home. Um, and I called my dad, like, I had, like, this like, anxiety attack and my counselor helped me call my dad. And I just wanted to hear, you'll be home soon. And he was like, oh, you're staying in Florida. And I'm, I was just quiet. Like, I couldn't even argue back. Um, there was a lot of, like, emotions going on at the time. Like, there was anxiety. It was, like, I was upset. Wasn't really angry because I couldn't blame him. But um, I went back to my room, and it was a tech at that treatment center that was like, well, you know, everything happens for a reason. Maybe this is where you're meant to be for right now. And, you know, I just gave up. Like, I stopped trying to fight and to get what I wanted. And I just kind of let whatever, whatever happened, happened. And, like, I followed suggestions. And, um, you know, I, and I had all this time because I wasn't working everywhere. I tried to apply in Florida wouldn't hire me. I was, like, six, seven months pregnant when I got out of treatment. And um, six months, yeah. But it's like you're fully surrendering now um, in treatment, in inpatient treatment. Um, and we'll hear the rest of her recovery story right after this. Welcome back, The Road to Recovery. So here we are uh, with Katie. Um, the recovery finally makes sense, I guess. You fully surrender. Was that the biggest difference? It felt like there was an actual weight lifted off my shoulders. Like, I can't, ex it was just a relief, like a bigger relief than I felt before. And like knowing that I didn't have to fight it anymore. And like that it, that I can stay clean and I can do this. Um, and that's not, and like I understood like it wasn't going to be easy. I'm going to have life happen. And like that was a stressful time in Florida. Like, you know, I was moving from, from the one halfway house with the treatment center because I was, you know, I guess, 
a liability for being pregnant. I moved to a different halfway house, and then I had no idea where I was going to go. Um, it got to a point where I was so stressed where I had two options to just run or just keep pushing through and just have faith that it's going to work out. Right. And um, I talked to someone, and she's like, well, ask your dad to come home. And I was like, he's going to say no. And, you know, after argu you know, arguing back and forth with her, just knowing that he's going to say no, she's like, you can't assume. And like I took that step and I asked my dad and, you know, almost almost two weeks later, I was on my way home. And I got home, like I got to IOP, completed that. Um, kind of, you know, I got into school um, last, last September and, or September before that. Right, you just got your degree? Yep. Just graduated and your son? Yeah, oh, my son, he's uh, amazing. Um, I just love just having the opportunity just to be in his life and to be present. Right. And like knowing he doesn't have to see that, you know, the using side. And, um, you know, he just, he's a big, like, influencer of like sure. my life. Like, so you're free, you're clean, you're a mom, you just graduated with your degree, you're working, got a new job in the yeah. industry. Recovery is great. So uh, that, it must feel fantastic, right? It does. It's a blessing, and I have to remind myself that when things get hard, because you know, you know, I get my stressful moments, and I get those times where I'm like fighting with someone, and I just don't want to deal with it. But you know, a lot of times I look at my son, and I'm like, he's worth it. Like, right. You've overcome so much, and the struggles were real, but and ups and downs and relapses. But you're you're clean, and you're, this is the best uh, place you've ever been in your life. Definitely. Thanks so much, Katie, for sharing. Yeah, we appreciate you, your hope, your inspiration. On the road to recovery, I'm Michael DeLeon. We'll see you on the next episode.